Now, the dear friends, this morning, I want to speak to you just a few minutes from, from the Word of God, and I want to speak to you on the key of David this morning, the key of David, and I want you to go with me in your Bible to the book of Psalms, Psalms 132, Psalms 132. I want to speak to you on the key of David. I want to begin this morning by telling you that I have a, a desire. I have a cry, a passion within me. I've had it since a boy, a young man, a young boy. I want to be a man after God's heart. David was a man after the heart of God. God said of him, that is a man after my own heart. I don't know about you, but how many of you know that's quite something for God to say that? When he looked at David, when he saw David, when he spoke of David, he said, that is a man after my heart. So God called David a man after his own heart. I mean, what was it about David that made God say that? God favored him. God made him king. God chose him above the rest of his brothers, his family. God took him from where he was behind the sheep and promoted him and made him king of Israel. I mean, the favor of God, the power of God, the blessing of God was upon his life. What was his secret? What was the key of David? That has been my desire. I still have it to this day. Is God, I want to, I want to please you. I want to be a man after your heart. I want to be a carrier of your presence. That's the most important thing to me, has always been the most important thing to me. When I was about 12 years old, my mom and dad divorced. And the moment that happened, God stepped in. Up till that point, I was, you know, uh, like any other ordinary 12-year-old playing around and, you know, just enjoying life as a kid. But when that happened, it was like God stepped in, into my life. I remember the last night, as a child, I remember the last night when we were together as a family. I remember the last night that we were together as dad, mom, brother, and sisters. I still have that memory. The last night that my dad used to close everything in the house. Make sure everything is closed up. Doors, windows. I love that. Made me feel safe. As a child, as a kid, I grew up like that. And my dad, of course, was a very powerful spiritual man. And um, my mom as well. Grew up in that kind of home. Uh, he would many times just go up to the, to walk through the house and pray. And then he would get to a place where he would, uh, uh, as, he, as he's getting ready to close up the house at night, he would open the front door and he would say, every devil get out of this house. Close the door and cover us with the blood of Jesus. It was wonderful. It was beautiful to grow up like that. So I have that memory. The last night... Uh, when he went and closed up everything and the gate uh, was closed the last night. After that, I felt because we never had that again. Because how many of you know divorce breaks up a home? It breaks up a family. It separates. And so what happened was is I felt, without me wanting to feel like it, I felt abandoned. I felt alone. But like I said to you, immediately God stepped in. It was like immediately whatever emptiness or void I felt, God stepped in. 
the presence of God became very real to me. Every day I would spend time with God. Every day. I was in my room worshiping God, praying, seeking God's face. Not because I had to, not because anybody told me to, not because I even thought of it. God drew me. The presence of God was in my life in that room on a daily basis. And I had no void anymore, no emptiness anymore. And I've got to tell you the truth. I didn't feel abandoned anymore. I didn't feel fatherless anymore. I didn't feel the void anymore because God actually took that place. In my heart and in my life, in my relationship with God, that's how real God became to me. That was my desire. That's why my desire, my passion, my cry was for the presence of God. It has always been like that since then. I was not like the other boys. I was not like the other young men. I was different. And it was because that was the only place where I found fulfillment, peace, protection, covering the presence of God. I'm saying all that to let you know today that the key of David is what I've encountered. The key of David is what this morning I believe each and every one of you must have. If you want to see the favor, the presence, the blessing of God come upon your life, this, I believe, is the key. The Bible talks about the key of David. I will give you the key of David. All right? So, I believe that David's attraction, he, God was attracted to David. Something attracted God to David. God even said of Saul, he said, I have rejected Saul. He wants to be a king. He wants to have a title. He wants position without my presence. He said, but I found me a man after my own heart. I found me someone and he wants my presence more than a position. Is there anybody here that, that can say this morning that you want the presence of God more than a title, more than a position, more than a career, more than a business, more than a relationship, more than any human being? I want the presence of God. That's what David had. That's what drew God to David. And Psalms 132 says, from the, let's read from the first verse. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to, to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. So David desired more than anything to bring the ark of the covenant, the presence of God, and give it a place, a resting place, a dwelling place, to build a place where the presence of God could abide. Up to that point, there were only tabernacles and tents, and the ark of the covenant was in Shiloh. It was in a tent. That's where the presence of God was. People had forgotten about God. And so David had a desire and a cry, I want to bring that ark, I want to bring it to Jerusalem. I want to bring it close to me. I want to build a temple for it. I want to give it a resting place. I want the presence of God. That was what David's desire was. This is what David was after. He was after the presence of God, and he said, I want to give that ark a resting place. Why the ark? Why the ark? Because the ark points basically to the person and the finished work of Jesus Christ himself. You know, on the earth, under the old covenant, there was a nation that was holy above all the other nations of the world, Israel. And in Israel, there was a city that was holy above any other city on the, on the earth. And that city was Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, there was a spot, there was a place that was the holiest spot, the holiest place. And it was Mount Moriah where the temple was built. And in that temple, there was a holiest, holiest, holiest spot in that temple. And that was called the Holy of Holies. 
And in that holy of holies, the, the holiest instrument or furniture uh, in that temple was the Ark of the Covenant. That was the center of the universe. That was the centerpiece of everything. That was the heart of God right there. God's presence would come upon that ark between the two, two cherubim and God would communicate or speak. That's where the high priest took the blood and he sprinkled it seven times on the mercy seat and that would make atonement for the sins of the people. So how many of you know that ark speaks of Jesus Christ. It speaks of His finished work. The ark was made of acacia wood. Acacia wood is an incorruptible wood. One of the hardest, strongest woods that you can find. God specifically said, you shall make it of acacia wood. And they covered it with gold within and without. A type of Jesus Himself, who was completely human, completely man. The wood speaks of, he, of His humanity. But He was covered with gold. It speaks of His divinity. Jesus Christ was 100% complete man, human. But He was also 100% complete God at the same time. He could feel tired, he could sleep, he could get hungry. He had all the emotions that we have. He could feel pain, he could bleed. He had a body, he was human, he was a man. But he was also completely 100% God in the flesh. And he was worshipped. He spoke of himself and said, I am. He was God and man all in one. Thank God for Jesus. And the reason He became man is so that there could be a man before God. Hallelujah. When the angels fell, God never sent His Son. God never became an angel to redeem them. But when man fell, God became human. God became flesh. He became one of us to redeem us and to bring us back. And right now, there's a man seated in heaven, at the right hand of God. Not an angel, not a creature, not a heavenly being. There's a man. Oh, hallelujah. Seated at the right hand of the throne of God Almighty. And the Bible says He's there to ever make intercession for us before the Father. He is the one that is between us and God. So we see that He is the ark, and the ark really represents Him, and it speaks of Him. And the ark was a wooden box, and then on top of the ark was a, a gold slab, and, and it had two cherubim on it. And Moses, of course, had to put inside of the ark the Ten Commandments, the rod of Aaron that budded, and he had to put in there the pot of manna. And once he placed it in the ark, they covered it with the slab that had the two cherubim on top of it, which was called the mercy seat. So the top cover that covered the ark was called the mercy seat. Somebody say mercy seat. And God said there must be two cherubim on that ark, on that covering, facing each other. Their wings must touch one another, and they must look down at that spot where the blood would be poured out on or sprinkled on. And the cherubim had to be beaten out of one slab of gold into that shape and form. How many of you know that Jesus was beaten and bruised and he was, uh, he was, he was, he was crucified on the cross just like those two cherubims had to be beaten and molded out of one piece. So Jesus, by His wounds we were healed. By His beating, by His punishment, by His bruises, by His wounds, there's mercy for us. And the Bible says that that slab, the mercy seat, was placed over the ark. And the Ten Commandments were inside, the pot of manna, the rod of Aaron. And all of that speaks of man's rebellion. How many of you know when God gave the Ten Commandments and He wrote on the tablets of stone, the people rebelled against God? He said, you shall have no other gods. They went and built a golden calf. They did everything He said they shouldn't do. So it's a type of rebellion against God. The, the rod of Aaron that budded, they rebelled against the priest. They said, who's Aaron? Remember that? God said, let every tribe bring a rod. And the rod that buds, 
that blossoms, that will be the priesthood I've chosen. So it speaks of rebellion against God's appointed leadership. And the pot of manna was the manna that God gave them to eat in the desert. And they rebelled against God's provision because they looked at the manna and they said, what is this? They said, this is useless. They said, this is useless. We're tired of this. We want to eat real food. They said we miss the garlic and the cucumbers of Egypt. They said we want to go back. We don't want this anymore, Moses. Just this bread, bread. How many of you know they rebelled against what God was giving them? That manna they ate for 40 years in the desert. I've been... I'm, <laughs> I've said it many times. I thought about it to myself. You know, the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, are probably one of the most blessed, successful, powerful, advanced people on the planet. If you look at the, the most wealthiest people, the most intelligent people, people that have had the most uh, technological breakthroughs, come on, people that are on the forefront of everything, You'll find that there's a Jewish heritage there. If you look at Israel, the Jewish nation, they should not, the, the way they have existed. Oh my God. I think we're about 300 years old. America's not even that old. There are nations that are only a few hundred years old. Israel is, they're thousands of years old. Come on, somebody. They are still in existence, and the whole world has tried to destroy them and be against them, but they stand. I say, but they stand. Oh, hallelujah. I believe it has a lot to do with the manna in the desert. They ate angels' food for 40 years, didn't get sick at all. They didn't have any problems, no issues. Hallelujah. They were kept and preserved by that bread, by that meal. But they said in the desert, we don't want this. We're done with it. We're tired of it. So it speaks of a rebellion against God. And that was placed into that ark. But isn't it amazing that God says, put the mercy seat over it. Put the mercy seat over it because mercy always triumphs over judgment. God did not want to see the rebellion and the breaking of the law. He said, put a mercy seat over it with two cherubim and make sure the high priest sprinkles blood seven times on that mercy seat so that when I look down, I don't see them breaking the law. I don't see them rebelling against me. I see the blood. Because how many of you know, it is the blood that covers. It is the blood that brings the mercy of God. Can we give God praise for the blood? Hallelujah. So the blood covered it. The blood was making atonement for it. 1 John chapter 2. The book of 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. I need everybody to read this with me. I need you to read this with me. I want you to read it with me. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That word there is the same as mercy seat. I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ, He is the one who finished it on the cross. His blood was shed and He is our mercy seat. And every time God the Father, I say God, oh, the holy God, the perfect God, the just God, holy God, when He looks upon you, He looks through the blood, He looks through the mercy seat, He looks through the sacrifice. I need a few people to lift their voices, their hands, and give God praise for the mercy seat. 
Jesus Christ is our mercy. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. So whenever the devil comes to condemn us, to make us feel guilty, we have a mercy seat. Hallelujah. But I fell, but I broke the law, but I made a mistake, but I rebelled. There's a mercy seat. Come under the mercy seat. Come under the blood. Amen. Let God see you through the blood of His Son, Jesus. Anybody who would dare to take the mercy seat off of the ark and look inside of a died, it happened. There were times that the people of God, there were one or two times that somebody took the lid off when the ark came back from the Philistines, when they captured it. When it came to Kiriath Yerim, the Bible says the people there actually looked inside of it. And they died. They were forbidden. They could not look inside of that. You know what? God doesn't want you to uncover, to bring back, to bring up what the blood has already covered. Don't bring up your sin. Don't uncover your sin. Don't uncover other people's sins. Don't bring back, oh come on, don't say you did that 20 years ago. Don't bring it up. The blood has covered it. The blood has cleansed it. Don't look inside to see the judgment. But stay under the blood. Come on, won't you wave your hand and say, I'm staying under the blood. Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't know about you, but I definitely have some memory loss. In a good way. And I know it's not a, a mental thing because my brain is perfect. I remember everything that I should perfectly. But I do struggle to remember issues and things. I just don't remember everything I did wrong. <laughs> I don't remember everything people did. They still, 10 years ago, they can still tell me exactly what happened the clothes they wore, who said what, and I just don't remember that. I think it's because of the mercy seat. I think it's because of the blood. It will cleanse your conscience. It will cleanse your memory. It will cleanse your life. It will destroy the past. Hallelujah. Thank God for the mercy seat of Jesus on the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Jesus, just like that ark, was the center of the universe, the center of God's heart, the center of it all. Just like that ark was the center of the temple. It was all about that. So Jesus is the center of it all. He's the center of the universe. He is the center. He's everything. The Father's heart is directed to Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I say He is the center of God's heart. He is the center of the universe. The sun rose today because of Him. The stars come out tonight because of Him. The fish swim because of Him. The birds fly because of Him. You and I exist because of Him. Everything that there is, is held together in Him, for Him, by Him. He is the center of it all. And He's the center of the church. In the temple, in the tabernacle of God, there's a lot of furnishings and a lot of ministering and serving and utensils and sacrifices. But ultimately, He's the center of it all. Hallelujah. So Jesus must be the center of our lives. Amen. And when He is, you have the key of David. Because David brought the ark back to Jerusalem. And the Bible says that first, when David, he had such a desire to have the presence of God, the ark of God, that uh, he couldn't wait. And so they brought the ark back to Jerusalem on a cart, on a new cart. And the Bible says that he had the right intentions. Everybody had the right intentions. They were praising God. But how many of you know that you can have right intentions and yet have bad results. 
People get married with good intentions and have bad results. People start businesses, good intentions have bad results. These things that happen sometimes, bad things happen to good people. Sometimes people have good intentions, yet things happen that don't work out the way we want it to. David had a good intention, I want the ark. Good intention, but bad result. Because they carried that ark on that new wagon. And how many of you know sometimes the new thing, when we try it in our own strength and ability, it works for a while. But then the Bible says it stumbled, the oxen stumbled. We can carry and fulfill our assignment, our mission, our purpose in our own strength, our own way with this new thing we're doing, God, for you. And we can do it up to a point, but then we stumble. Because we have to do it God's way. We've got to do it the right way. We've got to do it according to God's pattern. We've got to do it by the Holy Spirit, according to His Word, His will, and His ways. Can you say amen? Understand this morning that problems are part of the process. David, when that, when that oxen stumbled and Uzzah stretched out his hand to steady the ark, he died. And the Bible says, David was afraid. He said, how can I bring this holy thing to me? And so there was a man by the name of Obed-Edom. And the Bible says, David said, Obed-Edom, you've got to take this. I can't take it home with me. And so the ark went into Obed-Edom's house. And Obed-Edom looked after it for three months. But the Bible says something very powerful, that in that three months, God blessed Obed-Edom's house. And David heard about it. You see, what I want you to see this morning is that you can't reassign your assignment to somebody else. You can't give your calling, purpose, or destiny, your assignment to somebody else. It was David's assignment. It was David's calling. It was David's anointing. It was David's passion. It was David's desire to have the ark with him. But because of that problem, that stumble, he says, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Have you ever felt like you don't want to deal with this anymore? Let somebody else deal with it. Obed-Edom, you deal with it. And then God blessed Obed-Edom. And David heard about it. I want to say this to you. The key of David will unlock the blessing of God. The favor, the presence of God. If you have the presence of God in your life, if Jesus is the center of your life, your house will be blessed. Your business will be blessed. Your marriage will be blessed. Everything will be blessed. I'm not saying there won't be problems. There will be problems. But you'll get up. You'll move forward. You'll, God will lead you. God will take you through. He'll cover you. His presence will sustain you. He'll turn that mess into a beautiful miracle. Hallelujah. But you cannot give your purpose, calling, destiny, or anointing, or assignment to somebody else. That was David's assignment. That's what God called David to do. So don't give up your place, your purpose, your passion. Don't give up on the presence of God. Pursue the presence of God. Don't give up on the call, the anointing, the blessing, the favor of God. Pursue it. Don't give it to Obed-Edom. And if you have, then this morning I want you to go up to Obed-Edom's house and knock on the door and say, I want it back. I want everything back that I missed out on. I want everything back that I lost out on. But I am taking my place. I'm taking my authority. I'm taking my passion. I'm taking my assignment. I want the presence of God. I want the ark of God. I need about 20 people to say, I want it back. Tell three people around you, I want it back. I want it back. I want it back. I want the fire back. I want the anointing back. I want the presence of God back. I want my passion back. I want my joy back. I want everything back that I had at the ark. I want that ark back. Is there anybody that wants the ark? Here in this house, we want the ark. We want the presence. We want the passion. We want the fire of God. We want the holiness of God. We want the fear of God. Oh, lift your hands and worship Him. Say, God, I want your ark. I want your presence. I want it back in my life. Hallelujah. Woo, glory to God. Hallelujah. Don't lose your purpose. Because David almost lost his purpose. He kept his crown, his title, his palace, his wives, but he lost, he almost lost his purpose. 
He said, I will not sleep. I will not give any rest to my eyes until I have built a resting place for the ark of God. That was his purpose. He almost lost it. Don't let anybody talk you out of your purpose. Don't let trouble bring you out of your purpose. Don't let setbacks stop you. I don't care how many times the oxen stumble. You don't have to try and do anything. God's going to steady the ark. God's going to come with His presence. God's going to release His power. Are there any obeyed Edoms here today that say, I want the presence of God in my house, my house, my family, my home to be blessed. This morning I prophesy breakthrough is coming to your house. Favor is coming to your house. Blessing is coming to your house. The ark of God. I need you to lift those hands with me. Say, I want your presence. I want your presence in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can lose a title, but don't lose your purpose. You can lose a position, but don't lose your purpose. You can lose a friend, but don't lose your purpose. You can lose people, but don't lose your purpose. I've lost people. I've lost people. Some people say, bye-bye, I'm done with you. But I don't lose my purpose. As long as I have purpose, as long as I have the ark, as long as I carry that presence, as long as His glory is here, then it's all good. I want the ark of God, the glory, and God will bless this house. He will bless your house as long as you carry the presence of God. Hallelujah. Take the presence of God into your marriage. Take the presence of God into your business, into the workplace, into your school. Worship Him every day. Let His presence come upon you. Hallelujah. So Obed-Edom is blessed. This whole house is blessed. The children are blessed. Hallelujah. And somebody reported to King David, he's blessed. The ark has brought blessing to his life and his family. And King David went there. And King David said, Obed-Edom, I'm so glad you're blessed and enjoying the blessings. But that's my blessing. I'm here to take the ark back. How many of you know David interrupted, disrupted Obed-Edom's enjoyment of the presence? And he said, I will not let you enjoy this all by yourself. I want that presence, that blessing close to me on my life. This is my assignment. This is my purpose. I must build a resting place for that ark. And God said, this is a man after my own heart. The key of David is to make His presence, the finished work of the cross, to make Jesus the center of it all in your life. Hallelujah. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Hallelujah. Are you ready in this moment right now to interrupt, to disrupt the atmosphere this morning with your praise? How many Davids are here this morning? that say, I'm tired of hearing how other people are getting blessed, happy marriage, children are doing well. I want that in my life. It's time for me to have the ark. I'm going to worship God every day. Seek God every day. I'm going to be a man, a woman after the heart of God. Hallelujah. Oh, won't you come up and join me, worship team? Hallelujah. I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray with me where you are right now. Won't you lift those hands with me, pray with me this morning, and say, Father, I receive your precious word. I want to be a man after your own heart. I want your presence. I want the ark of your presence in my life and today Jesus be the center of it all be the center of my life be the center of my home be the center in my family 
be the center, Lord. Your priority, Lord. I prioritize your presence. I choose your presence to know you, to worship you, to seek you above everything else. Be the center, Lord, in my life. I want your presence, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray for each and every person this morning that prayed this prayer. I ask now that you will respond. I ask that the presence of God will come upon them. That the presence of God will fill them. That the presence of God will wash them. That the presence of God will empower them. That today, like David, they will cry out for the presence of God in their lives. In Jesus' name. And I remove every hindrance. I remove every distraction. I remove it from their lives and their families and their homes. Right now, right now, right now, right now. I remove it from your house, from your marriage, from your family, from your children's lives, from your physical body. Right now, let Christ be the center of it all in your life, in your home, in your family.
Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the mercy seat that covers our wrong, our rebellion. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for your love, Lord. For your grace. Yes. We come boldly to the throne of grace. We come boldly to the mercy seat to obtain help in a time of need. Right now, something powerful is happening in this room. I want every eye closed. Open your heart. I want you to see the blood that covers the blood that speaks for you, the mercy seat. There will be no more guilt, no more shame, no more condemnation in your life. The blood cleanses you, covers you. Washes you. I want every person in this room today, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, then I want to pray with you. You don't have to live with that shame, that guilt, that condemnation anymore. You say, preacher, you don't know how bad I am. Listen, the blood of Jesus is more powerful than any sin, than any mistake, than any past. It's only the blood of Jesus. It's only the blood of Jesus that can cleanse, that can wash your life. Maybe you have missed your way. Maybe you've missed the mark. Maybe you've missed the presence of God. Like David, you're here. You know God. You know the things of God. You've been in church, but something's been missing in your life. And like David, you say, I want it back. I want it back. I want the ark. I want the presence of God back in my life. I want to pray for those that want to be included in this prayer. Here in the house of God and online, join me now. Just slip up your hand and surrender your heart. Surrender your life. Come back to God. Come to the mercy seat. Run to the mercy seat. And I want everybody in this room to pray with me now. Everybody. I want those that want to be included in this prayer. Raise your hand up high and let's pray together now. Let's all pray together. Lord Jesus, today I receive your word. I believe it. You are the Son of God. You died for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood that was shed for me. I believe with all my heart that God raised you from the dead. Jesus, you are alive. I confess you today as my Lord, as my Savior. I come to the mercy seat. Cleanse me with your blood. Wash me with your blood. Cleanse my life, Lord, with your blood. And I thank you for it. I receive it. I receive it. I am cleansed. I am washed. I am redeemed. I am delivered by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of Jesus. I am free. By the blood of Jesus. Right now. I renounce. Everything. That's of darkness. Of the devil. Of the world. The blood of Jesus. Sets me free. And right now those of you that have prayed that prayer. I release upon you here in God's house and online. I release upon you now the power. The cleansing, the washing of the blood of Jesus. There it is. Receive the peace of God. Receive freedom and liberty. Let the presence of God come back into your life. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody agree and say amen. Lord, today we come to the mercy seat and we thank you for healing in this house. Sickness will be taken away from the midst of us. We thank you for favor. 
deliverance, blessing. Father, we want to be like David, a man, a woman after your own heart. We want to be like David. We want to worship you every day. We want to seek you every day. And we want to be carriers of your praises. We want the ark of God more than anything else. Nothing else matters. We want your presence in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You may be seated. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. Paul the Apostle writes and says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup of the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. Oh yes, we sang it this morning. We're going to sing hallelujah till He comes again. And this morning, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, the bread is His body that was given for us. It is His body. You know, the Lord Jesus said this to God, the Father. He said, you were not pleased with sacrifices of animals, of bulls, of rams. He said, but you prepared a body for me to give you as an offering. Jesus knew why he was on earth to give his body as a sacrifice to God. And when he took the cup, he said, this cup is my blood shed for you. How many of you know you're bought with the blood of Jesus? You're bought with blood. In gangs, in certain sects or religions, gangs, whatever, they try to make people realize their commitment through blood. Shedding of blood, blood covenants. Can't be part of that until blood is shed. How many of you know that when it comes to your faith in Christ, it's through blood. You're a Christian by blood. You're in covenant by blood. You don't become a Christian by just joining a church, just praying a prayer. Blood was shed for each and every one of us to become a child of God. The blood of Jesus. What a privilege, what an honor to be here this morning because of the blood of Jesus. You don't step out. When you become a Christian, you don't ever step out of it again. You don't walk away from your faith ever. Because the Bible says, those who do, they trample on the blood and they crucify Him again. So how many of you know you've got to protect and guard your faith, your relationship, your walk with God? Stay in the Bible. Read the Bible. Stay in prayer. Stay in the presence of God. Stay in these meetings. Don't miss church. Get connected. Protect your faith because blood was shed for us to have what we have. It wasn't easy or cheap. It cost him everything. His life, his blood was shed for us. Church, this morning, let's eat the bread. It is the body of our Lord Jesus. Let's eat it together. By his wounds, we were healed.
we are one body. Christ in us and we are in Him. Let's take the cup and drink. It's His blood that was shed for us. Bought with the blood of Jesus. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We proclaim your death by eating this bread and drinking this cup together. We proclaim today your death. And Lord Jesus, we are, we are expectant, we are excited because you're coming again. Until you come, until you come again from heaven, Lord, to come and take us away, we will sing hallelujah. We will proclaim your death, your name, your word. We will let people know about you, about your love. We will make your name glorious, famous and known. And everybody said, Amen. Can we give the Lord Jesus praise? He's coming for us. I said He's coming for us. If you're excited about the coming of the Lord, can we give God a praise and a shout? He's coming back again. Woo! Hallelujah. And the world and the news media and the reporters will say millions of people disappeared overnight. Aliens abducted them. No! It's not aliens. It is the coming of the King. It is the church that was raptured. And He's coming back again. And we will come back with Him. To reign with Him. Oh, come on. Somebody say hallelujah. He's coming back again. How I cast out the spirit of the Antichrist. I rebuke that spirit today. There is a rapture. There is a coming of Jesus. And the church will be ready. Can you say amen? Woo, hallelujah. I feel like having church this morning. This is the second half. <laughs> Woo, let's go for the second half right now. Hallelujah. He's coming back again. Are you ready? Are you excited? Are you expecting? Hallelujah. Coming to take us and then we come back with Him. Hallelujah. To reign as kings. Woo! Kings. Please tell the person next to you, you don't know who you're sitting next to today. <laughs> kings. Hallelujah. The Bible says God did not subject the coming world to the angels. But He subjected it to the church, to us, that we will even judge angels in the coming world. We are the world rulers with Christ, our King. Come on, give God a praise and a shout. The church is the triumphant church, the victorious church, the powerful church. Woo, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor Mark, come and tell us. <laughs> I've been looking for an opportunity. How? Where? See what you can do. <laughs> Keep preaching, Apostle. Come on, give God praise, church. Come on, give Him praise. I don't know about you, but I'm stirred. 
I don't want to miss any meetings. I don't want to miss what God is doing. Be here tonight. Don't miss out tonight. Hallelujah. I believe we're just going to go deeper, further, higher. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. I think the best way to maybe get us ready for announcements is um, if we can have the announcements to play on the screen. Please take note of these announcements. Take note of the following announcements. Every Wednesday night, we have a powerful time of life group. We are a church that believes in community. We believe what happens on a Sunday gets extended to our life groups every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. If you want to know more about what life group is, you want to connect to a lead in your area, you can go to the back and there will be someone at our welcome desk that will assist you further. Every Thursday night at 7 p.m., we as a church intercede and pray and expand the kingdom of God through the power of prayer. We want to encourage everyone to join us every Thursday night at 7 p.m. to join us for an hour of power. And we believe God is expanding His kingdom as we are praying. Every Friday night is Fusion Friday. So for those who are between the ages of 13 and 21, you are more than welcome to join us every Friday night at 7.30 p.m. for a powerful youth service. So bring your friends, bring your family, and we can't wait to see you there. On the 10th of September at 9 a.m., we are so excited to announce that our Encounter Seminar is taking place. Our Encounter Seminar is geared up for you to have an encounter with the living God. Not only will you experience deliverance, but you will claim back dominion. So if you are interested, you can go to our welcome desk at the back and register. There's a, there will be a registration form that you need to fill out or contact the office for more information. That's all the announcements for today, church. God bless. Amen. So please take note of those announcements. Also, I just want to uh, drop these with you. So please take note of these announcements as it's very, very important for these ones. Maybe you are here today. Maybe this word has stirred you as well to, you know, be effective, be used of God, and you have a desire to raise up disciples, lead a life group in your area, take your territory for Jesus Christ. We are starting our discipleship training on the 16th of August at 7 p.m. It's a Tuesday night. Our, our discipleship one is building your foundation. You got to understand that your foundation is the most important thing to lay in your life. If you feel you want to be part of that, register after the service. Don't wait. Don't leave this place and think about it. No, God is tugging on your heart. The Spirit of God is moving in your heart after the service. Register for the discipleship training, building your foundation. And then all those that did it last or the, the, the first part of this term, uh, you've got to go to discipleship two and discipleship three. Please make sure you register for that. It's a Tuesday night at 7 p.m. It's a five-week course. I guarantee you, you will be empowered, stirred up to become effective in the kingdom of God. Once again, it is the 16th of August at 7 p.m. church. Register for that discipleship, building your foundation. And then as well, church, if you have been visiting us for some time, you've been coming to RWC, you feel like you're part of the furniture here, um, but you have never yet been on our Walk in His Footsteps seminar, or maybe you're visiting us for the first time today, and you have never gone on our Walk in His Footsteps seminar, that is how you become a member of this church, how you become part of this family. You come on our Walk in His Footsteps seminar, it's a two-night seminar, it's going to be taking place on the 22nd and the 23rd of August at 7 p.m. as well. Please register for this seminar. And um, there is just a small fee because we want to put a manual in your hand. And this manual is as Bible school. It tells you how to hear the voice of God. It explains to you, how, you know, how to overcome temptation in your life. It tells you how to, uh, you know, uh, become a son and a daughter in the kingdom of God and so on and so forth. So I want to encourage you to become part of this vision, become part of this house. That's once again the 22nd and the 23rd of August at 7 p.m. Please register for that on your way out after the service. And now, for a very, very important announcement. Please make sure your neighbors are listening to this announcement. I don't want you to miss out on this one. I know I was told I mustn't push it, but I can't help it after preaching like this. It is our spiritual father's, it's our spiritual father's birthday this coming Saturday, the 13th of August. One thing about Pastor Mark is I'm big on celebrating birthdays. 
I think it's so important to celebrate life that God has given, and it's our spiritual father's birthday on the 13th of August. That Sunday, the 14th of August, we're going to take some time in the service to honor him and to spoil him and to bless him and to show love and appreciation towards such a man of God. We have uh, printed envelopes. If you have not yet got one and you would like one so that you can place a, a, a gift uh, a, a of honor in that in that envelope, just slip up your hand right now. One of our beautiful service ambassadors will get one to you. Otherwise, you can always get one at the welcome desk over there and come prepared. I see some have already been given. Thank you so much for that. You don't have to wait until the 14th, but uh, that day we'll take a special moment in the service to be a blessing to Apostle and just honor him for his birthday. So on the 13th, Send many blessings to Apostle on social media. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. And I want to also, again, just encourage you, if you are here this morning and you feel in your heart a stirring to become a, uh, a disciple maker, a leader, you want to disciple people and help them in their spiritual walk with God and raise them up and expand the kingdom of God, you want to impact people, then please register for the discipleship training. That we'll train you, we'll equip you to do that, to become that, and to be influential uh, in the kingdom and in the purpose of God. Amen. Well, church, uh, Pastor Maria also sends her love to you. She hasn't been here with us, with me for a couple of weeks. She has had some, you know, struggles uh, physically, but I am glad to report that things are going much better this morning. I believe, I really believe that she'll be with us next Sunday. Uh, but please keep her in your prayers. Keep us in your prayers as a family, as always. And uh, it's, I just wanted to announce that so that people don't think that, uh, where is Pastor Maria? <laughs> uh, why is she not coming? She will always be here. She'll come uh, uh, with me. Uh, but we needed her to just get back on track physically and uh, praying for her in every area. And just like I said this morning, how many of you know you, the presence of God, the ark of God, it affects every area of life? Yes, problems, issues, challenges do come. How many of you note, note that? I was kind of, I went through something myself last year for a couple of weeks and months. And you know what? At the end of the day, I want you to know something. When you go through something, listen, problems strengthen you. Problems improve you. Problems empower you. You have a lot more of compassion for people. And how many of you know sometimes it's good for the spiritual people to go through stuff? Because when you go through stuff, you come out on the other side and you have a lot more compassion for people. But the Bible says, if anybody, if anybody, James says, if anybody's struggling or suffering, let them pray. Hallelujah. Why does he say that? Because prayer changes things. Prayer changes homes and lives. We're not going to, we may be knocked down, but we're not knocked out. That's what Paul the Apostle says. You may have times and moments where you had a knock, but you get up. And you get on and you fight the good fight of faith and Jesus is victorious. So I'm believing that, looking forward to that, seeing you this weekend. I just wanted you to know that she sends her love, your inner heart and thoughts and prayers. Things are going well. We're standing on the Word of God and the presence of God. The key of David is what changes lives, homes and families. Would you stand with me as I bless you today? Keep us in your prayers. We keep you in our prayers at all times. Father, I bless your precious people. They are precious. They belong to you. And I bless them today that the favor, the peace, the presence of God will be upon them in Jesus' mighty name. This entire week, every day, that they will be drawn to worship God, to walk with God, to know God, to seek God, to pursue the presence of God. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. We love you. We look forward to seeing you tonight at 6 o'clock. Remember to join us at our Connect Station and spend some time together. God bless you.